Here's what I think is the most effective arm workout I've ever designed using scientific principles. Welcome back, Dr. Mayo Wolf here, PhD in sports science, bro scientist, and proud owner of Wolf Coaching. Before we go into what I think is the best arm workout I've ever designed, I need to make you understand why it's effective so that you can then go away and design your own really effective arm workouts, you know? All right, what makes a session effective for muscle growth? First, it needs to fit within your program. The best, most grueling arm workout really only works if you do it the right way in the context of your program. I could give you a 40 set arm workout, eight hour Rich Piana style. It's basically an eight hour arm workout. And yet, if you only do it once a year, it's not really gonna grow you all that much. Conversely, if you did it every day, it would probably be too much for you to handle. So good sessions only exist within the context of their programs. Now, this specific session is designed within the context of being repeated with some variations two to four times a week. If you run a body part split where you're only training your arms directly once a week, you're not going to want to do this you're gonna want to like double or triple the amount of training being done here. Importantly, doing a similar session as this one two to four times a week falls within the optimal frequency range of training each muscle at least twice a week. Another big thing a good session does is to limit redundancy. If we have a session that's super redundant, we may not actually target all the muscles we're trying to target. Different muscles have different functions. And importantly, there is evidence of diminishing returns within a given session if you just keep training the same muscle group over and over again, hammering it with time tons of volume. For example, an older meta-analysis by Krieger and colleagues found that each additional set yielded less hypertrophy. The first set you do within a session for a muscle is the most important, and each additional set has diminishing returns. So we don't want to do a ton of very similar movements for super high volumes within a session at the expense of other muscle groups being hit effectively. For example, doing some bench press, then some dips, and then some pushdowns is going to be likely super effective for your medial and lateral head of the triceps, but the long head that gets trained more effectively during overhead extensions, for example, won't get all that much love. And certainly your biceps won't get that much love. So we want to limit redundancy. Another thing we want to do is to make sure the rep ranges we pick within the session are maximally effective for hypertrophy. While we used to think this was eight to 12 reps per set, and outside of that, hypertrophy was compromised, the reality is that the hypertrophy rep range is as wide as five to 50 repetitions per set. And additionally, there is some evidence that if we combine different rep ranges within our program, we might see a little bit more hypertrophy compared to just using one and religiously doing sets of eight for example. And so if I see a program that only has sets of eight or three by 10 on everything, not a good sign. Equally, while we do want a variety of rep ranges and there's a pretty wide range of maximally effective repetition targets for hypertrophy, we likely want to have most of our training come from sets of five to 15 repetitions because it makes it easier for us, according to some work by our own research group, to tell how close to failure we're training. And since training relatively close to failure is pretty important and your accuracy at gauging failure breaks down above around 12 reps, we want to do most of our work between say five and 15 reps to maintain a good degree of accuracy, engaging our own proximity to failure. Next, we'll want to make sure we're using optimal volumes. What does that mean? Well, based on some more recent research, the best muscle growth for a muscle is usually seen somewhere between 20 to 35 sets per week per muscle in trained individuals. So across the week, if we want to maximize growth, we want to get up to this volume, whereas if we just want robust growth, for example, we're not specializing on the arms, between 10 and 20 sets might be very adequate. Since we're performing the session two to four times a week, that means that we want to be training each muscle with maybe three to eight sets. Keep in mind that these numbers for maximum hypertrophy of the biceps, triceps, and forearms are based also on indirect volume, meaning that bench press for your chest, for example, does count as a set for your tricep as well. And so if we get three to eight sets two to four times a week in, that gives us a range of just direct arm volume of between about six, to about 32 sets. And if you then add in your chest, back, and front delt training, that can quickly get you up to these really effective volume ranges for the arms. And importantly, some of the research suggests the triceps might benefit from higher volumes slightly more than the biceps. That's a meta-analysis by Buzval and colleagues, where the effect size was larger when it came to the triceps 
in favor of higher volumes above 20 sets. We also want to make sure that we're taking each set and each exercise sufficiently close to failure to maximize hypertrophy. Based on meta regression by Robinson and colleagues from around a year ago, the closer a set is taken to failure, all else being equal, the more hypertrophy it stimulates. However, going closer to failure does likely also cause additional fatigue. And so if we go too close to failure, too often, too early into a session, we might compromise performance in that session overall. And so to get the best of both worlds, we might want to go a little bit further from failure earlier in the session for the first few sets of most exercises and a little bit closer to failure later into the session and for the last couple sets on most exercises. Next, the exercises we pick to train our biceps, triceps, and forearms need to be maximally effective. And there are certain things that make exercises better or worse for muscle growth. I have a whole series of videos on exactly that topic that you can check out in the description below or above here. But in the meantime, here's what we look for in good exercises. First, the exercise we pick should target one of the primary functions of the target muscle. For the triceps, that's going to be elbow extension. For the biceps, it's going to be elbow flexion mostly. And for the forearms, it's going to be a combination of wrist flexion and wrist extension. Additionally, the target muscle should be the limiting factor. And that's where, unfortunately, most of our arm training is going to have to be relatively isolation heavy. If we want to optimally target the arms, whether that's the biceps or the triceps or the forearms, most of the best exercises that do so will be isolation exercises because they allow us to make sure that the target muscle is what's limiting our performance. But equally, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing compound chest and back work in your program. You should still be doing that because it provides a good overall stimulus and because it effectively trains your chest and back, which hopefully you're also trying to grow and you're not just some widow trying to grow only your arms. If you are, get off my channel. Next, whatever exercises we do pick should be stretch friendly. And there's three components to that. First, the muscle we're trying to train should be placed in its lengthened position. So for the triceps, that means flexing the elbow and for the long head of the triceps, getting it overhead. For the biceps, that means extending the elbow at the bottom of the exercise and getting your arm behind you. And for the forearms, that means either getting your wrist extended or flexed, depending on what you're trying to train. The second part of being stretch friendly is that in that position, there should be a fair amount of tension. And the third part is that it should be length and partial friendly, whatever exercise we do pick. There's a growing body of research comparing length and partials or doing partial repetitions in the stretch part of the movement to doing full repetitions, generally finding better hypertrophy with length and partials or similar hypertrophy. And so if we're trying to maximize hypertrophy, being length and partial friendly is a positive attribute for an exercise. The next component is being actually loaded or not. Essentially, all else being equal, having spinal loading or really loading any other non-triceps, biceps, forearm muscle groups isn't really doing anything to grow the biceps, triceps, or forearms anymore but it is causing more fatigue and potentially making it less likely that the target muscle is the limiting factor. And so something like a standing overhead press where you're stabilizing the load with your lower body and with your spine may not be as good of a choice for tricep hypertrophy as a seated dumbbell overhead extension. And finally, especially if you're someone who's time constrained, the exercises we do pick should be time efficient. Selecting exercises that require minimum warming up and minimum loading of the bar and minimum setup are going to be more time efficient and that can be really helpful. Next up, our rest times should be designed to be maximally effective for inducing muscle growth. There's a few things we know. First, rest times of much under 60 seconds do likely compromise hypertrophy. So rest for at least 60 seconds the vast majority of the time. However, it turns out that even though resting for insufficient time between sets reduces how effective each set is for hypertrophy, we can make up for this, to an extent at least, by just doing more sets. And so there is a component of personal preference here. Do you prefer doing more sets with shorter rest times or fewer sets with long rest times? Personally, the approach I use and recommend is to simply rest for as long between sets as you need to maintain a good level of performance from set to set. For most arm training, isolation-wise, it's gonna be between one and two minutes between sets. And for most arm training, if it's compound in nature, it's gonna be closer to maybe two to four minutes. But ultimately, let your performance guide you. As far as exercise order goes, the research suggests it's not hugely important. In fact, a meta-analysis by Nunes and colleagues found essentially no effect of exercise order on hypertrophy. However, on a principled level, as a coach, there's a few things I like to do when it comes to exercise order. First off, generally, the exercise is targeting muscle groups that are more important to us. If, for example, we really want to bring up our biceps and triceps, will want to perform first in the session when we're freshest. Probably doesn't make a huge difference, but I think it makes sense. Second, we may want to order exercises as a heuristic in a way that maximizes performance across the session. If, for instance, starting your session with cable pushdowns negatively impacts your performance on the subsequent bench press exercise, but benching first doesn't then impact your performance on pushdowns, 
the latter arrangement may be slightly preferable. And third, as a general heuristic, I would recommend starting your sessions with compound exercises and then moving into isolation exercises. And this is where arm training gets a bit dicey. Because arms are generally best trained with isolation exercises, in my view, you will likely be training them after some compound training. Based on the research on exercise order, that's likely not a huge deal, but if your arms are a huge priority to you, and you really just want to get bigger arms, it may still make sense to train them first in the session. And the final component of an optimal workout for the arms is going to be good technique on all the exercises you do perform. We were actually involved in a recent review paper looking at exactly what makes a technique good or bad for hypertrophy, and by our estimation, there are three or four components that make up good technique for muscle building. The first is an adequate tempo. Repetitions should last somewhere between 2 and 8 seconds to maximize hypertrophy in all likelihood. There's some more speculative evidence that a slightly longer eccentric of say 1 or 2 seconds at least per rep is beneficial and a slightly more explosive concentric is also beneficial. However, within this 2 to 8 second range roughly, you likely won't see a difference in terms of hypertrophy, so preference can be at play here. Second, range of motion. Specifically, we want to be emphasizing longer muscle lengths. As I mentioned earlier, there is a growing body of evidence looking at the effect of the stretch on hypertrophy, suggesting that length and partials might be a good idea for hypertrophy. At the very least, what you don't want to do is to avoid that loaded stretch or skimp on it. So, use a full range of motion. Alternatively, if you want to lean further into this, then try using length and partials where you perform half reps in the stretch component of the movement. The final big component that hasn't been studied extensively yet, and we're actually planning a study on this, is momentum generated by other muscle groups or other joints than the target muscle. For instance, during a bicep curl, you could be using your hips and your back to swing the weight up. Is that a good thing? Probably not. Ultimately, generating momentum through other muscle groups and other joints besides the one we're trying to target does nothing to really increase the stimulus on the target muscle, but it does generate more fatigue and overall makes it less likely that the target muscle will be the limiting factor as opposed to your glutes getting tired of jerking the weight up. And finally, if a certain technique causes you less pain and still adheres to the above criteria and or you just enjoy doing it more, by all means, go ahead. By the way, I have whole videos on all these topics, exercise order, volume, repetition ranges, frequency, and all that that are linked below in the description, so go check them out if you need more detail. Let me give you a few notes before we delve into the arm workout. Generally, with this arm workout, start with some compound movements for your back and chest. Back and chest if it's an upper day, or just chest if it's a push day, or just back if it's a pull day, you get the idea. If on the other hand, you are following a body part split routine and you're training the arms directly once a week and then getting some accessory volume in from your chest and back days, just up the volume a little bit for this session and potentially do an additional exercise for the biceps, triceps, and forearms respectively. If this is you and this is an arm day specifically, I would probably start the session with a dip and pull down superset to cheekily increase the frequency for the back and chest as well to twice a week and get some pretty solid lateral and media head of the tricep hypertrophy and also biceps as it turns out one study's found similar hypertrophy from the pull down in the biceps as compared to a curl exercise but without further ado let me give you the best arm workout i have ever designed or at least i think so using the most up-to-date scientific research we'll start this session with a cable overhead extension and seated bench cable curl superset perform both of these for three to five sets of 10 to 20 reps with about 90 to 120 seconds of rest between sets for the same exercise or however long it takes you to roughly maintain a good level of performance from set to set. Take the first few sets of each exercise to about two repetitions in reserve and take the last set all the way to failure. One thing you'll notice in both of these exercises is that they're solid for hypertrophy and in fact both of these focus on the stretch. When it comes to the triceps we have two studies directly comparing the overhead extension to the pushdown for example. In the overhead extension, the long head is lengthened to a greater degree by virtue of your arm being overhead. One of these two studies found more hypertrophy from the overhead extension versus the pushdown in all of the tricep essentially, and the other study found, broadly speaking, no difference between the two. Likewise, when it comes to the biceps, in my view, the data also supports the importance of the lengthened position. And so, doing a cable curl on a bench where you allow your shoulders to come back all the way and get a deeper stretch is likely a good thing for hypertrophy. Both of these exercises are isolation exercises targeting one of the functions of the muscle groups involved and are highly stable and make sure the target muscle group is the limiting factor by virtue of it being an isolation exercise. Finally, if you don't want to superset these two exercises, you just have too much time on your hand from being unemployed, then consider not supersetting them and doing them separately. But personally, I like the pump it gives me and it saves time, so win-win. Alternatively, if you don't have cables or cables are pain to get in your gym, you can superset the dumbbell overhead extension, ideally seated, 
with a dumbbell preacher curl. Once again, these two exercises take advantage of the stretch position or isolation exercises and are generally just good picks when it comes to stimulating hypertrophy. Once you've done this first superset for your biceps and triceps, it's time to move on to the forearms. We'll be supersetting the dumbbell wrist curl and the dumbbell wrist extension. If you just want to do one exercise for your forearms, feel free to miss the dumbbell wrist extension as you are getting into severely diminishing returns as far as training your arms. The wrist extensors aren't particularly large muscle groups, so training them is not mandatory by any means. Perform two to four sets of five to 10 repetitions on the dumbbell wrist curl and 10 to 20 repetitions on the dumbbell wrist extension. Rest for about 60 seconds to 120 seconds between sets of the same exercise. When you're training your wrist extensors, you're essentially resting your wrist flexors and vice versa. As I mentioned, training the wrist extensors directly is very optional as you run into diminishing returns. However, if you go a little bit heavier or lower in reps on the wrist extensions and a little bit higher in reps on the wrist curls, you'll find you can use pretty similar loads. And so you just need one pair of dumbbells, a bench, and you can train your whole forearm pretty well. And by your whole forearm, I mean most of your forearm. And if you're the sort of person to be interested in this stuff, check out the Strong by Science article on forearm training for more detail on training forearms than anyone could possibly ever need, but is a phenomenal resource for people who are interested. Forearms in general are an optional muscle group to train. I don't think it's necessary for everyone, but if you want your biggest arms overall, I do think it makes sense to at least train your wrist flexors a couple of times a week. When you're performing your wrist curls, make sure you focus on finger extension as well, as many of the wrist flexors are also responsible for finger flexion. And so extending your fingers at the bottom of each rep gets you a deeper stretch in those muscle groups, potentially being better for hypertrophy. Both of these exercises are stretch friendly. They offer a good stretch, better than the standing variation for the forearms. Dumbbells are typically a better option in my view than barbells. From my coaching experience and my personal experience, fewer people get pain doing the dumbbell variation because there's a bit more freedom in your wrist positioning, I take it. You're not locked into full-on supination or pronation for either of the exercises as you would be with a barbell. And additionally, dumbbells save time compared to barbells on account of not needing to load them up. So that was the arm workout. As a note on this session, if you are specializing on your arms or you're doing this as one arm day a week, add in another exercise for each muscle group involved. So two exercises for your triceps, two exercises for your biceps, and maybe an additional exercise for your forearms as well. Before we wrap up this video, let's check whether or not this session fulfills the criteria for what makes a session maximally effective. First off, by doing one exercise for each muscle group, we're limited redundancy and the stimulus being provided. We're also varying rep ranges across the session, going a little bit higher in reps on your arm isolation work than you'll typically go in compound work, which overall provides you with a good variety of rep ranges from your compound and your arm isolation work overall within your program, potentially leading to a bit more hypertrophy. If you repeat a similar arm workout as this one two to four times a week as part of your upper body sessions or what have you, you will get a really solid amount of volume in across the week. By taking the first few sets of each exercise a little bit further from failure and then going closer to failure and all the way to failure on the last set, we're getting the benefit of going to failure on certain sets without compromising hypertrophy by having performance take a big hit. We picked really effective exercises for each muscle group involved, making sure that the triceps, biceps, and forearms are the limiting factors, that we're targeting one of their functions, that the exercises we pick are stretch friendly. And additionally, the exercises we picked are time efficient as well. We're resting for at least 60 seconds between sets, but for as long as it takes you to maintain a good level of performance set to set. While exercise order isn't super important, we generally started with the bigger and more important muscles being the biceps and triceps, and then moved into the forearms, with the forearms being a bit smaller. And additionally, by not training the forearms first, we're not getting the potential knock-on effect I've noticed from training forearms before biceps impacting your performance on the bicep training. And finally, we're using great technique on all exercises, making sure our tempo is adequate. We're taking about two to eight seconds per rep at the most, having a slightly longer eccentric, a slightly more explosive concentric, pausing in the lengthened position, generally minimizing the involvement of non-target muscle groups and making sure we emphasize the loaded stretch by using a full range of motion or using lengthened partials. That was the most effective arm workout I could design in the context of a good program. If you trained your arm once a year, would you be better off with Rich Piano's eight hour arm workout? Maybe, but in the context of a good program, I think this is a really solid arm workout. That is the video. If you enjoyed this video, please comment, like, subscribe, leave a comment down below, letting me know what other muscle groups you want to see me break down. Similarly, if you aren't subscribed already and around half of you aren't, please do consider subscribing, hitting the bell as well so that you get notified whenever I release a video. It really helps out the channel and helps me put out more good information for you guys. If you're looking for a coach, consider checking out the link above and we could be working together. In the meantime, have a fantastic day and I'll see you guys, my subscribers, in that next one. Peace.